Good afternoon, everyone. This is Honoring Indigenous Veterans Day in your classroom for November 8th. And I know that some people do actually um, now consider that a week for celebrating um, the sacrifices and accomplishments of the veterans that have uh, served in Canadian military across the board, including the Navy. Um, today's session is brought to you by the ARPDC, Alberta Regional Professional Development Consortium. I belong to the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium, and it is funded through Learn Alberta. Do a land acknowledgement before I start. So I'm just going to make sure I, that I make sure I mute everybody. And that can be irritating to some people when they're trying to listen. If the sound isn't loud enough, please let me know. I've got it set from a meeting this morning that seemed to work okay. If it's not working, then just let me know, please. So, Tanse, I live on Treaty 7 land, which is the ancestral home of the Blackfoot people here in Calgary. They're also Diné and Métis Nation over three people. Um, there are people across Canada from different nations that live here, but it is traditionally Blackfoot land, so I thank them for allowing me to live on their land. Just give you a little bit of my background. Um, if you haven't been to one of my presentations before, if you have, bear with me because it'll be the same information. Um, my name is Tammy Johnson and with Air PDC, we're now called Designers of Professional Learning, which is a really good encompassing title as we do uh, these online sessions for educators as well as face-to-face -face workshops and presentations. And there's curriculum work and work on special days, for instance, for Orange Shirt Day, we worked in collaboration together and presenting that for that entire week. My family is spread over Métis uh, on my mom's side and we're, and I was raised by my mom's family. So um, we're from what is historically known as Red River Settlement, which was a term that was used um, post the Red River uh, resistance um, when the Canadian government took hold of the land in the West. And uh, we don't actually have settlements in Manitoba or Saskatchewan. Mount Albert is the only province that has those. For those of you who are Indigenous or Métis for sure, you know we all identify ourselves first of all by, uh, you know, what is your, your last name, your family, and where are you from? That's how we identify ourselves. So my family's surnames are Mowat. My mom's a Mowat. McDonald, Mackay, and Beaudry. So you'll notice most of my family is Scottish Métis. Uh, the Beaudrys are actually family from here in Alberta. They're a French voyager family and uh, quite prolific of Makai's on the Beaudrys right across uh, the prairies, lots of big families. That's a picture of my great grandpa there uh, sitting on the bench by the rocks. Um, I think that picture's from about the late 1800s and then his surviving children, my grandpa Rosser is the third boy, well, the middle boy, I should say. Um, and then his brother, Stanley Oliver and sister Tassie. And then I think that picture is probably about 1916, so I'm lucky to have those pictures. Um, in Fort Saskatchewan, if anybody lives there or has worked there, there is a school named after my great-grandpa, James Mowat Elementary, as well as a park, Mowat Park, right beside it. And in Edmonton, there's uh, James Mowat Trail. It's spelled with two Ts, but I always tell everybody it doesn't really matter. The name is spelled M-O-A-D. When they came to Canada, the British didn't understand that a D and a T. <laughs> well, D sounds like a T in Gaelic. Or Orcadian, which which is the case of Moets or from Orkney. Um, I started working in the quarry of Winnipeg. My family is from Selkirk, which is just north of Winnipeg, but I went to school in Winnipeg and I taught in the same school division in Seven Oaks School Division, actually. Um, and I was the only Indigenous teacher in my school, <laughs> funnily enough, um, with a high concentration of Indigenous peoples there, but there weren't a lot of um, us in the school divisions teaching and and also don't forget that a lot of people didn't identify themselves particularly as Métis back then um the last census I think the next census is going to blow up because there's so many people that aren't necessarily even Métis they're they're mixed heritage but not as Métis are also identifying themselves as that now because it's not such a stigma I've worked mostly in special education and with Indigenous students but I've taught almost everything except for high school math and science and I always say no one wants me to do that so um, the other thing is that I started working um, in this area a couple of years ago with Katasca Nile Tribal Council and Ignite eLearning to develop their outreach program um, for grades seven to nine. Um, 
I took their program and based it around the seasons because that's how they teach their children. And I indigenized it for their particular culture and decolonized it. And I added land-based learning and Cree language. I worked in concert with their specialists who were extremely knowledgeable and helpful as well as the elders were very pleased with the, the work that I did so that they could add their teachings into it. So I was encouraged to continue this work in that area and I do uh, curriculum work in with different areas. I did a project with the Edmonton SPCA for their seven grandfather teachings it's online for grades one to two and then uh, three to six. I work at Bow Valley College with their indigenous upgrading program as well and uh, different contracts that may come up with them and wherever that kind of uh, work is needed. My goal here is to help particularly non-Indigenous teachers to feel comfortable to present information about Indigenous ways of knowing and being and Indigenous issues, um, bring those to light for you as well. But I also know that there are Indigenous uh, teachers that don't have this information, a lot of it either, or it's just a lot of research and that's something I love to do. And so hopefully I can bring that information to you guys. With that said, we'll start with the AIR PDC resources if you haven't seen these. And I know um, when I was starting last year doing this, a lot of people actually hadn't seen these resources. And I saw that today, I think with the weather and I'm in an older neighborhood, my internet is a little slow. Um, but there's lots of stuff that's already been developed by Alberta teachers and educators that um, has been funded and, and done already. The main one you probably know is Empowering the Spirit and there's lots of great information here um, under foundational knowledge, leading the learning classroom supports in Orange Shirt Day and beyond. And it's also laid out this way. There's lots of stuff on there. Um, my particular favorite on here, just if you're looking for some resources is Orange Shirt Day and beyond. There's some teaching tools on here and programming supports. For instance, there's um, some posters you can print out in regard to Orange Shirt Day and having sharing circles and things like that. So those are already done and they're for each division as well, the way that they're done. So they're really nice and you can print them out in color. The other thing you can do is you can search on find resources by focus and there's all the different areas as you'll see. But of course, I'm going to look at the First Nations, Métis and Inuit only at this point. And as you can see, if I just click on that, it comes up with a lot of different resources and most likely ones that you have seen. I know the two that uh, I find the most common, like, yeah, here we go. Uh, Education is our Buffalo is one that's been around for quite a while. It's still a really good resource. And then Weaving Ways is another one you may find in your staff rooms or in the resource areas as well, that sort of thing. You can also search by your TQS or LQS. There are some resources in en Francais, but um, they are working. I know that the French team is working diligently to try to have all resources eventually available in French as well. Um, or you can go and explore featured websites, that sort of thing. So there's that. And there's also by audience and by level and by type. So there's quite a good search engine on there as well. So just like point that out to you. So if you're looking for resources, just quite a few already created. But I do want to start with, um, just looking at National Indigenous Veterans Day, uh, we'll start with just the government message because this is what they have posted on the website and it's a really good snippet and short one, especially to show kids if that's something you're looking at. I've got some others, but we'll look at this in particular. Quick, 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 I'll say hello and bonjour. Today, we're honored to celebrate the Indigenous veterans who have served in missions across Canada and around the world in times of war, conflict, and peace. While not often enough acknowledged, the military service of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis in Canada has deep roots. It's so important that we recognize, commemorate, and remember their sacrifices. On November 8th, we'll come together to mark National Indigenous Veterans Day, honoring the important contributions of Indigenous peoples in service to Canada. As we reflect, we remember those who lost their lives and those whose lives were forever changed. We hold their loved ones, families, and communities in our hearts, lest we forget. As we continue to take steps on this shared journey of reconciliation, we remember all the Indigenous peoples who have served and protected Canada across generations. Indigenous people have fought beside our allies in the First and Second World War. And today, they also serve in Canadian Armed Forces efforts around the world. 
from NATO duties in Europe to serving with United Nations peace operations. The service of Indigenous peoples in times of conflict goes back generations and truly shows them that there is more that brings us together than sets us apart. Our diversity as a nation makes us stronger. Take some time to learn about the folks like Henry Norwest, Tommy Prince, and Debbie Isen. The history of Indigenous veterans in Canada is filled with stories of heroism and leadership. No matter the barrier that the government and their chains of command and put in place, Indigenous veterans have always stepped forward to serve. It's a legacy of service that continues, and it's up to all of us to honor them. Indigenous peoples continue to proudly serve Canada in operations at home and overseas, as they have bravely done for more than 200 years. Today, more than 2,700 Indigenous members continue to serve in Canada's military forces. We are grateful for their sacrifices and contributions to Canada's history and to Canada's security. On Indigenous Veterans Day, Remembrance Day, and every day, we honour the service, the courage, and the sacrifice of all veterans at home, around the world, and across generations, lest we forget. Thank you. Merci, Marcy, Miigwech, Nakurimi. I'm just going to flip through that so it stops playing. But you also notice a couple of um, symbols that were in there. There's the beaded poppy. Um, and then there's also the special pin. I've got a, one of those for my grandpa. My grandpa, I didn't put a picture of him in here, but um, he served in the Navy in World War II. And he was actually uh, 32 years old, so well past the age of having to enlist. Um, two reasons. Indigenous people feel the need to... First of all, like they're saying, um, there is that warrior spirit that you are to, you know, sacrifice yourself for your nation, whether that be the entire nation or your particular clan or your your group of people that you're with. And also my grandmother would not marry him in world during that period of time if he wasn't serving. Her family was actually um, from England. Her father was Swedish, but her mother's family was English and she was raised by them. And because of what was going on in England, um, she was very adamant that if anybody was going, she was going to marry them, they had to be serving. It didn't matter how old they were. So my grandfather, and he happened to be about 12 years older than her, and he he enlisted for those two reasons. And he said, okay, I'm going to go. And um, he was a fisherman, so he he went into the Navy and, and served off the coast of Labrador um, and Gaspé around that, in that area. And uh, there were German U-boats that were passing through that area Um and uh, yeah, it was not, a, it was a kind of a terrifying experience for him. Unfortunately, he didn't actually get, have to engage, but uh, there was always that risk. So yeah, <clears throat> and in our town, even back home in Selkirk, as a little girl, right at the end of our street, there's Memorial Park. And the majority of the names on there are, are Métis names because my the town that I come from, um, Selkirk is mainly a, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is gone, a Métis uh, settlement uh, just north of lower fort gary where my family was from as well in okamak and so yeah it was it's interesting i grew up with that all around me i have my grandpa's military stuff so it's really important to me um i asked my my cousin when my grandmother died if i could take his hat and, and i've got his medals and things like that so something that's uh very important to me and i think you know being made to is a little bit different we'll we'll learn and i'll show you guys if you don't know kind of situation especially with first nations people what what happened to them when they went to serve but we can go back because they said in the video, you know, over 200 years, uh, we go back to the War of 1812 when Canada, you know, was not yet officially a country, it was still part of the, um, you know, British North America Act under that that law. But the United States wanted our territory. So they wanted to come here and take it from England. And it's really important to know that if you go into the battle history, and I do have a, a brother on my father's side, and he's... I'm, I have different siblings of my mom and dad been married a few times but um, um my one brother is in the military as my father was as well so i my both sides of my family have a long serving um history of being in the military i was born in germany because my father was in the military and my brother adam actually was put through school to study um military history it's one of his favorite areas because he's in the military and uh you know looking at this is that Canada's a country itself defended by 
if you look at here, right, looking at these people that fought, you know, uh, Sean A. Chief Tecumseh, and um, the Mohawk were involved, and the Mi'kmaq were all there. The Mi'kmaq particularly helped um, with uh, battle plans and showing them how to fight in that area because of the terrain and the land and was so different than what the British were used to. And, um, you know, knowing where they could fight and, you know, where they could win. And they they did battle plan, plans with them and showed them. And they if they hadn't had the Indigenous people there with them, we could have been the United States, right? That would have been different. Although, you know, who knows how that would have turned out. But, you know, at any rate, we're, we're Canadians and proud to be so. So, you know, if you look at it that way, um, we would not be still this country, at least not in the eastern part of Canada, would may perhaps have been part of the United States. Um, so it is an interesting fact. Um, I did copy this off of a CTV news article. So if, and there's a link there and you will get the copy of the slides and you can go and look at that. Um, I thought I'd start also with contributions of Indigenous veterans and show you 14 uh, facts that you may not know about the contributions of Indigenous veterans, particularly because it's something you can share with your students too. Um, this is Bob Joseph's website. If you don't know about him, he wrote 21 Things You Should Know About the Indian Act. Um, he has a consulting company in Ontario and he works particularly with uh, non-Indigenous companies to help them to deal with and to negotiate and work with Indigenous either uh, reserves or uh, companies, corporations, and things like that that involve Indigenous peoples. So again, you'll see that poppy. And it's become a symbol to the beaded poppy, right? Because um, beading is such a big part of Indigenous culture, you know, for, particularly for, for uh, Métis, for sure. And there are some other articles in here too. I didn't include them, but you know, if you want, there's Indian veterans equal in the battlefield, but not at home. And then, you know, about some war heroes and things like that. I did put some of these links in the end for resources for you too. So um, the first one was that voluntary enlistment was high. So there were, um, they're saying Aboriginal communities, because this is the term that they were using back then, communities where health and education levels were advanced and where they were advanced, almost every eligible man joined the armed forces. So there is a high contribution of indigenous peoples in Canada period uh, that have served in the military across the board. And like I said, there is that um, real drive to serve. There always has been for indigenous peoples, right? Especially to serve and protect is important. Um, two is due to the poverty and diseases on reserves, um, many were unable to pass medical exams. And so there was a lot of shame actually for many First Nations men that when that happened because they felt poorly about not being able to serve, but it was of no fault of their own given the conditions that they were living under and many are still living under. Um, three is that in the First World War that there were more than 300 status Indians that died and then hundreds were wounded. And many of them died after the war when they came home. And the disease, especially once they came home because they weren't well, and then they were on the reserves, they died because they didn't have medical treatment that was available. So that was a huge tragedy. Um, for us at the end of the Second World War, Indian Affairs reported that there were 3,090 status Indians had participated in the war. And that's 2.4% of the people at Canadian, at Canadian census, but that did not include non-status Indians, Inuit and Métis soldiers, because they did not track. And men like my grandfather would not have identified themselves as Métis anyway. Um, they tried to blend in, even though my, my grandpa was pretty obvious that he wasn't uh, white, but, um, you know, many people, because he had very white features, didn't really, you know, see anything. He could have just been very tanned. Um, Five, it's estimated that 12,000 Aboriginal people served in the two world wars and Korea. And it's a large number, if you think about that, right? Considering how many Indigenous peoples there are were left in Canada at that point, especially given the low numbers of people that were living here. Um, and then despite, for number six, despite the many decades of poverty brought on by life on reserve and restrictive government policies and additional hardships, most able-bodied men who left to join the armies and indigenous communities felt compelled to con contribute to various war funds. So they were donating money. So like you can see, it says approximately 44,000 was raised and donated during the First World War and during the Second World War, 23,500, which doesn't sound like a lot of money today, but think about in those 
in those dollars in those days because I know you could buy a loaf of bread for a couple of cents, right? I remember I grew up with my grandparents and my nana grew up during the depression. And, you know, my grandpa, like I said, served during the second world war. I got to hear about the ice boxes and all the different things and what they did, right? So it's a lot of money considering that they had very little, you know, on the reserves. And then enfranchisement was extended to include status Indians who joined the military. Um, when they returned, they found out they lost their status and they had no home to return to. So there were a lot of these men who served. They ha could have been wounded, um, particularly, or, you know, I mean, at least I have shell shock, what we used to call PTSD, because I know I, the town where I grew up in, there was a mental health hospital. Um, that's actually how my grandparents met because my Nana was a nurse there in training for the, uh, she was a psychiatric nurse. And I remember there was a gentleman that used to stand around in town and he would walk around and I was a little girl and kind of scared me because he would just stand and stare at people and not do anything. And my Nana told me he had shell shock that um, he was a very gentle man because she had known him as a patient um, and not to be scared, but he didn't recover after the war. And of course there was nothing there to help them. Imagine coming back and not even being able to go back to your home if you're on a reserve. So you've lost your land as well and your status and no money. Um, Anyways, I'm going to go through every single one, but I mean, these are some of the more important ones, right? Um, and it's it really is as well, some interesting ones here, like number nine, Manitoba, where I come from, was the first province to recognize November 8th as Aboriginal Veterans Day, which we now call Indigenous Veterans Day. Um, and it wasn't for number 10, it wasn't until after 1995, 50 years after the Second World War, that Indigenous peoples were allowed to lay wreaths at the National War Memorial. So think about that, allowed to do it. So until then they couldn't, right? And now you can see that there are uh, indigenous people that not only that, but are allowed to have ceremony there, which was also something that wasn't allowed. So, you know, um, if you look at the, the last one, number 15, we've got, you know, today an extraordinary diverse con contingent of more than 1200 First Nations Inuit Métis people serve in the Canadian Armed Forces representing many distinct cultures in over 55 dialects. So we have a diverse group of people serving in our military that are in, in fact indigenous and they contribute a lot to, um, you know, the overall culture of Canada. And like I said, there's that overall, and if any of my friends, right, we talk about, you know, um, if whether they're First Nations or Cree or Métis, it's always, you know, that warrior spirit, right? The men are always like that. Like they're the protectors. They protect us if we go out. For instance, I go out with um, AIM, which is American Indian uh, Movement with friends and uh, do outreach, you know, in um, different places where, you know, people like the drop-in center downtown or, you know, in Forest Lawn, but not far from where I live and these places. And um, that's what the men are always there, right? They're always protecting us. And we're saying, you know, the warriors are protect you and it's not a joke they mean it right that it's part of the culture that's there um you know and i'm giving you some of the the bad stuff we'll talk about that but then we're going to give you some really good stuff and the resources and show you how to honor the people that are you know had served and are still serving um like i said that like there is that dark side and this does come from veterans affair canada as well it's it's not me as veterans affairs has this online and i i took this from there talking about that dark side right of how the Canadian government treated these communities, even just the, the people that were not just coming home to the reserves and not having your status anymore, but Canada expropriated hundreds of thousands of acres of reserve land during world, the world wars. Um, some of their land was also taken and given to non-Indigenous people as part of a program that granted farmland for returning veterans. The government typically denied this reestablishment program to Indigenous veterans and also treated them unfairly in other ways. Um, they also hoped, I think Indigenous people also hoped that they would be seen in a better light if they served and they would have more rights because they'd served the country and, and given up for them, but that didn't happen. Um, they often were denied full access to full veterans benefits and support programs. So imagine coming back, you denied access to your home, you no longer have anything from your reserve, and then you cannot get veterans benefits and support programs. So I think you can also see how, and especially a lot of these people attended residential schools, they may have been first, second, third, fourth generation going to these schools, some of them, um, depending on you know where they were. And so they had this trauma on top of it, plus what happens during war, which is horrendous. 
particularly the first world war was brutal um you know and they served on the front lines and they were left behind they were they were discriminated against unfortunately for the most part so that's that's the sad part of you know our our history with indigenous peoples here in our country um you know like i already said that they lost their status right and so it's it's hard it's a hard um <laughs> pill to swallow um but i do want to start looking at the good stuff right like let's look at celebrating our veterans i think we can't forget those things that happened and i think there's definitely movement to change that um but you could see how layering on some of these traumatic events and things that have happened in our history have led to a lot of the issues that we've had um particularly with indigenous males that served there and, and what happened to them but this is a good one this is about honoring our indigenous veterans Some of our, our most decorated veterans are Aboriginal people. It's a native's contribution on our reserve. Uh, you know, uh, I think I counted over 30 people that joined the military in both the United States and Canada. I think one of the things why I enlisted, we had uh, two First World War veterans in our reserve. I was impressed with the way that they conducted themselves. They had that military bearing. Many people during the World War has joined uh, to defend their treaties, that their peoples were signed with uh, the government of Canada. You're a soldier, you're a soldier, no matter what color your skin is or what language you speak. If you ever sit in a trench, you realize this person beside you is from Newfoundland or from Quebec or BC or the North, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. In the end, you're still a soldier, but you're still a person and you still have a unique history. You don't know them from a hole in the ground and you get to know them in a hole in the ground, you know, and you learn a lot about them. You just become really good friends. They went through hardships, no question about that. But uh, they always said that, you know, it was something that they wanted to do for the country. You go into battle or you go wherever, you need that trust and you, you need to be part of that team. Um, and that's the absolute first thing that the military teaches you. I think as time goes on, there will be more understanding to their culture, their traditions and way of life. The freedoms that we exercise today has came about because of the uh, Native people and Aboriginal veterans who have sacrificed their lives so that you and I continue to carry on the experiences that they fought for. For our young people, be they Métis, First Nation, Inuit, our people served. We have a warrior spirit, not one to bring harm, but one to ensure peace within our nations. And I was very proud to be a Canadian, I still am proud to be a Canadian today. And our contribution for the defense of this country, in my mind, shall never be erased. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think if we start looking at the good stuff, right, and um, the serving, um, like I said, I was always very proud back home. Um, my aunt actually paid for a banner because they have banners up around the town um, around this time of year, and they put them up everywhere and um, down the streets. And so she took a picture of the one with my grandpa that my family has. It's it sat in the Legion two years ago, I think. They, they rotate them where they are. So yeah, it's very important. Um, I just thought I'd show you a couple of things because you can show the kids this as well if you're able to get them. I know the beta poppies run around $60 a piece roughly because they take a long time to make. Um, but there's a, you know, kind of a look at, there's different types that you can get. Um, the kids could even, you know, do them on paper if they're the younger ones or, you know, color something that looks at, you could talk about indigenous beading then too. And of course, this is the, the from the poem in Flanders Field. Um, there is a version actually in Flanders Field of different languages if you search. Um, I think there's one in Korean and I think there's one in Ojibwe that you can find as well. 
Um, but yeah, as you see, it says uh, here, like a handmade beaded or woven poppy uh, are very important symbols, right? Because that comes from our people is, you know, um, handiwork and making things by hand is really important. And just there's that symbology, right? Especially with Métis people, the, the flowers are very important that we create. It's in the chat. Um, I mean, it says, I have bought poppies from the website Tribal Roots for about $18 a piece. They're also handmade. Oh, okay. Yeah, if, yeah, if you find out, make sure that they're made by um, Indigenous peoples, for sure. Because <laughs> I know there's a lot of places you go, they um, sell things quite, so for $18, I, I don't know. They might, I don't know what they're made out of, but that would be interesting to see. Um, this is the pin that I have. You'll notice it's right beside some sweet grass. Um, I have this pin. I love it. It's got, um, you know, the Métis sash all the way around the edges. It has the beaded poppy in the middle. It has Inuit and Akshuk sign underneath and has feathers there representing the First Nations as well as all of the, the peoples. Um, so that's what, and I, I always get complimented on it whenever I'm wearing it. And I'm super careful not to lose it because it is apparently very hard to get these now. I don't know if it was a limited edition thing, but I wear it with my uh, Métis sash pin that I have. So I want to give you some other resources to your classrooms then. I know that's what I always want as a teacher is what can I use here? So um, there's an honor list and I'm going to show you. So if you wanted to look this up, and especially if you have Indigenous kids in your classroom and you want to find, um, this is the surnames A through K and they have uh, pictures wherever possible. I actually, I realized it was here and I was like, I'm going to send in one of my grandpa too and um, get them to add him. But what they have is they have all the names um, and then they have the band or first nation that they're with um, or where, what their heritage is. So right now it looks like mostly first nations people. So I believe it was started for that reason. So there's all that. So you can always search and the kids can look for names that they may recognize as well. It goes on and on and on and on. Um, and then there's also the L through Z. So Again, there's lots. They can maybe, or even oh, there are some me too. There's more, um, but you know, go through and, and look because you'll see. Yeah, that one says this is from St. Paul, Saskatchewan, from Winnipeg. I love the team. Yeah, come come and name back home. And they've got people from Duck Lake as well. Yeah, so there's all that. So you know, if you've got kids in the class that happen to be you know from those areas or you, they identify as Indigenous, then um, you know you can get them to take a look at that. And then I also down this, which I thought was really interesting. The Government of Canada, about the National Aboriginal Veterans Monument. Um, just, it's in Ottawa. And it was actually a lot of hard work, apparently, to get this done. <laughs> um, and there are more images on there as well, if you um, take a look, but sculptor and painter Lloyd Pinay uh, of the PTC uh, First Nation in Saskatchewan designed that monument. So um, if you look at it, see it's got the symbol of the eagle, particularly, right, which is very important. A couple of messages in the chat. Oh, the link. oh do you want the link? For, Lizzie's asking, I think, for the link for the, um, the copies you bought um yeah and so anyway so this is a really nice it, it's beautiful right and so it does tell you the inscription on it right for all those who have fallen um raised in sacred and everlasting honor of the contributions of our aboriginal canadians in war and peacekeeping operations and it does go on to describe many of the hardships that um occurred for indigenous peoples then and again because up until 1995, Indigenous people weren't even allowed to lay a wreath at the National Monument. This is a huge thing that this actually came about and occurred. So, yeah, I think that it's an interesting one to show kids, especially, and, and point that out to them. Oh, have you seen it in person? Oh, that'd be awesome. Julia says it's just online. Yeah, it would be amazing to see that in person. Probably make me cry. Because <laughs> the one back home, oh, I did it. Sorry, skipped ahead of me. The one back home, I remember as a child, always going there and reading the names and seeing some of my relatives there and thinking how sad that was. Um, okay, so there's a write-up on the monument that explains all the significance of each part. That's really awesome. 
Awesome. Um, I thought I'd show you guys this as well. This might be something you wanted to look at. And I know sometimes as teachers, we're looking for different ways to give back to Indigenous communities. And there is this Indigenous Veterans Initiative. Um, and what it's about is that there's Indigenous unmarked graves. So there's unmarked graves of many soldiers, not just Indigenous ones. But in particular, um, they were not treated so wonderfully. They were forgotten. It was kind of like, whatever, they're, they're Indians. It doesn't really matter. So there's a big push now to to find these unmarked graves and to give them their traditional names too, right? So instead of their colonized names um, for many First Nations, particularly to give them their actual name. And um, so this is interesting too. So there's, what they did was they took the Anishinaabe teachings of the seven grandfather teachings and, um, or the seven sacred teachings, depending on how you want to say it, like Cree artist, uh, Jason Cartier, uh, or Carter, is it Carter or Cartier? I think it was Cartier. Anyways, um, they they can use these as symbols as well. And this belongs, and then they've got a link to Empowering the Spirit, which I showed you guys at the very beginning, right? So this website for Alberta is used quite a bit. And then there's some different articles at the very bottom that you can take a look at and uh, um, go through the, those as well if you'd like to take a peek. And then this one, my muskrat magazine, which I always like to use because it's so Canadian. Well, she's going to find a magazine named muskrat magazine. <laughs> and again, it is about the, the memorial. So, and this is a better picture. I like this one better too. So, okay. So yeah, it's like, yes, yeah, you can see all the animals better on here too. So it explained the, the um, significance of all the animals I'd imagine. Um, but then on this one as well, they, get into a little bit about some of the war heroes and some of you've probably seen these pictures before. So Alexander Smith Jr. Uh, had an essay for World War I. And so, you know, just talking about what he did, um, he was, um, you know, his, so as get, he got a military cross for his work on September in uh, 1916 in Somme, France, uh, where he proceeded with a party of bombers and captured in an enemy trench and 50 prisoners displaying the greatest courage throughout. He was twice buried by shells, but stuck to his post, which sounds about right. <laughs> Our men keep going and they don't give up. <laughs> um, then there's Charles Checkers Tonkin, who was Cree and Métis in World War II. They give you a little bit of information about him. He was fluent in Cree, so he was a code talker. So that's, and so I think there's a movie in the States about code talkers, but they don't talk about the Canadians that did this as well, especially working with the British, right, and helping them during the World Wars. Uh, Charles Denton Smith also had an essay uh, for World War One, and he was there for 10 years, and he rose to the position of captain, and he also got a military cross um, two days before the war ended in November 9th, 1918. He led his platoon forward with such rapidity that he surprised a team of enemy sappers preparing to blow up a road mine. And uh, his party deactivated the fuse just before ignition. And he captured a machine gun from the enemy group. So he's a pretty bold person. Um, then there, there's some women, of course, they mentioned as well. So there's Charlotte Edith um, Anderson Montour. And she was First Nations as well, a nurse. And Francis, I don't want to make mess up his name in such a way. Uh, Pigum, Pigum Magabal. I'm not saying with the right intonation. I know that for sure. Because in Korea, I know the intonation. Um, so he was a Jibway in World War One as well. George McLean, Henry, Henry Norwest, uh, Tommy Prince, of course, which most people know about Tommy Prince, right? That's the big one. I remember there was always that um, film that was shown on TV on CBC when I was a kid about Tommy Prince. So he was, you know, very important. And then Tom Longboat was also an important one. So there's a few there anyways for you guys. Um, just to give you some of that information for the kids, they can see that. And again, I, I don't think I have time to go through every single resource, but I just want to let you know that I put these here for you as well. Just there's, this one has some books. So I thought this would be really good to show you um, this particular one. So this is from Trent University and just some other links on here as well. You can look, I tried all of them, a couple don't work anymore, but, and then there is more information about the Veterans Monument. This picture here from um, the Canadian website. And then Canada Remembers program as well. So there's that, and that's for all, in, all Remembrance Days. Uh, and then this book list. So I thought I'd show you this as well. So there are books that you can um, access. 
right? We talked about the Navajo Navajo code talkers. Um, and again, like you saw that one was Cree. So he, he there's code talkers for all the different languages as well, right? And the Navajo are Diné. And Diné, um, from what I understand from a presentation that I was in, uh, the Diné people, are the, they believe themselves to be the largest group across Turtle Island because they go all through the states. And they're, you know, Northern Canada going into, you know, like Sutina here is uh, Diné and then going into Arizona, Mexico, and apparently spreads all over. In Canada, it's the Cree that exists, and it's the largest group of people. But yeah, then it's about the Scout Tommy Prince, and then there's a book just about Indigenous peoples in the World Wars, and When the Spirits Dance, which is a really good book about a Cree family during the Second World War, and it's a children's book. This is that one. my internet is very slow today with cold for some reason so this is again from veterans affairs canada so um just a, like a little you know a couple of pagers that give you some information that as well you can share that and again goes over the canada remembers program it's just some good resources especially because i know with the older kids i had everything online for my grade nine class and that was like years ago already so i know we still do that and then canadian encyclopedia i think is always a great resource this goes over uh, the involvement of Indigenous peoples during the war, including volunteering, right? So again, there were people who couldn't um, get in, go to war because of their health. A lot of them just volunteered instead. So that's important to know as well. So a lot of them were there. And again, you'll notice some of the same individuals are mentioned there because they're kind of the big, big names. Um, and this is from APTN. It's a focus. It's on YouTube, and I'm not going to show you this, but it's like it's a long um, interview with a bunch of Indigenous veterans and just talking about some of these things. And so this would be a really good one for that kind of grade nine and up into high school area. Um, you know, looking at. I just want to cue the beginning of it so you can just see the very. Kind of the... So it's moving. That's one. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just going um, to, and this one is about talking about how the thousands are under-recognized. And that's why I say it's probably better for that grade nine and up, up group because they can you know, understand that better. So Evelyn has it in the chat, says there's also a CBC video I watched with students before, um, mentions the sacrifices made and the, that other veterans got housing when they were returned except them. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I've specifically seen the one from the CBC. Um, I know CBC usually does do really good work in that area in particular um, in terms of Indigenous peoples and really um, highlighting some of that. Um, yeah, maybe you want to send it to me and I can take a peek at that one. I was trying to find ones really that were kind of that, again, that hard hitting. So if you've got that, that would be good. Um, the Government of Canada has some podcasts. I just highlighted one here there's actually three so this is part one there's three parts to it so if you go on here you can see um is sitting by the fireside and it's commemorating indigenous people's military service and again this would be really good for those those um older kids you know just talking about what goes on and there is a, a transcript for each one as well so if even if you wanted to, you didn't want to listen to it and you can you know go through the interview with your students you could do that as well and that would even work for the younger ones and Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is pod a series of podcasts as well. Um, <clears throat> well, sorry, I don't. My mouse is so touchy right now. Ever since I traveled, it's acting weird. <laughs> Got to reset it. I think. So this one in particular has uh, for Valor Canada has uh, planning activities for Remembrance Day, and they're not just for Indigenous peoples. Um, but I liked this one especially because too it's um they've designed these educational materials using the six historical thinking concepts and Bloom's taxonomy. So for those of you who are you know that's kind of the area that we're working in and um, education with those areas. Uh, there's these planning packages. I just thought I'd show you. Oh, there we go. 
so and it is uh, free and fair use as well so there's all kinds of stuff on here about remembrance day but again it can be applied to um first nations as well because they do have some things in here like uh, in regard to that i'm just talking about so just some resources there um but, yeah, as well as this one for class or youth groups so getting in for the older kids so there's hmm. I know with the young ones, it's not, it's not so hard, right? Because we can talk about things with them. We can show them pictures online. And the older ones, I find, you know, um, just trying to fit it in and making it relevant, making sure that we're covering the bases in the sense that they understand, you know, the truth of, of what has happened for Indigenous peoples. And oh, take notes. Oh, I don't want to look at my email. <laughs> um, and then there's this last one. A gal, I guess in my mouse, holy Right. So there's this resource here, Honor, Educate, Remember, Teachers Resource, and then there's a student resource as well. Um, and there's that no stone left unturned, right? So honoring all of the people that have served. Right. So I think it's a really important program to, to look at that, you know, and they, they talk about our role in peacekeeping. And, and I think it's really important to focus on the peacekeeping, particularly for us as Canadians and Indigenous Canadians, because that is really the role, like I said, of the warrior. And, and he said that very succinctly in that one video, um, you know, talking about, you know, he's, it was Métis gentleman, and he was saying that, you know, that the role of the warrior in, in Indigenous society is a one of protector. It's not a one of, is a peacekeeper. A warrior is a peacekeeper. They they don't, their first action is not to fight. The first action is to protect and to try to diffuse problems before having to do that. So I think that's also a misconception because of Hollywood and um, not understanding the role of, of men in Indigenous society. And I think that's really important. And yes, there's Indigenous women who have served. So I think it's really important to understand that as well, that, um, you know, Indigenous culture is not inherently a sexist culture. So that's really important to understand as well. But particularly men have a role of, of being protectors. So I'm going to stop sharing that and I'm going to stop recording.